Hello. Very pleased to be here. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a background about me, just to kind of frame things. So um, I started out as an industrial designer. So I, I began my career, believe it or not, designing uh, play sets for Cindy, so toys, uh, electrical goods, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, began to realize that actually designing all that kind of stuff wasn't particularly helpful. It all began to end up in landfills and began to realize that actually design could uh, find its way through to doing something a little bit more useful and realizing actually that, that, that it's services that really shape our lives. We were very lucky to be able to step through into what's now known as, well, not, not what's now known, it's always been service design about 17 years ago. Um, we founded Engine, the service design consultancy, um, and we've been incredibly lucky over um, the last 17 years to work with all sorts of uh, blue chip clients. We work across loads of sectors from airlines, hospitality, utility, financial services, um, healthcare, retail. Um, and working with those organizations, we have practiced essentially what would be referred to as, as multi-channel or omni-channel um, service design. We would never view ourselves as um, a, a UX business. Uh, we wouldn't really view ourselves so much now as um, really a design business, believe it or not. We are, we're, we're, sort of, we're sort of moving, moving on from those things. We are very agnostic um, in terms of the, our disciplines and the solutions that we, we look to provide for our clients. We step back and start very much from what's the issue, what are we trying to solve, and what's the very, very best way of, of doing that, and how do we help the organization to succeed in that way. And in that sense, if there's a market that we operate in, it's a customer experience market. So we're not in the design market, we're not in the management consultancy market, we're in this customer experience market. Um, and again, just to frame things, in terms of who we find ourselves competing with, obviously the likes of you guys and agencies, but also increasingly going toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, consultancies, so, so the big four management consultancies that are out there. So they seem to be operating very much um, in the space that we are. Um, but what I wanted to share with you today um, was really about some of the things that, that we see going on in service design, where we see it all going. And this is very much shaped by our experiences over 17 years working with these you know, billion dollar businesses. And we've seen them um, do lots of things, actually. We've seen them kind of work all the angles to gain commercial advantage. We've seen them increase their marketing spend. We've seen them focus very much in on operational efficiency. We've seen them um, get involved in you know, the, uh, the, the classic sort of digital transformation. But it feels as if, for them, they're reaching the limits of what um, a focus on efficiency and, and technology can actually provide for them. And having done all of this, the original question still, still stand in their mind. You know, what do customers want? How can we make them, how can we get them to buy more? And really, how can we get more of those sorts of things um, to market faster? So these are fundamental questions that those businesses um, still face. And it's becoming apparent that they need to think differently about how they do that. They need to think differently. They need a new approach. They need a new mindset towards the way their, their organizations operate and essentially how they change because they're trying to change. They're trying to do things differently. And they're realizing they need to move away from what's fundamentally a management approach to change, which is defined by uh, a focus on technology, on, on resources, um, on marketing, through to one which um, is very different. And I hope you guys will recognize. So it's an approach that's much more customer-inspired and vision-led. It's one that's faster-paced, far more experimental, one that engages and excites businesses, one that moves from insights through to informing new propositions, from propositions to informing what experiences should be, and then fundamentally moving from an understanding of what the experiences should be to what the capabilities are 
of that organization um, to move forward. Now, I hope this sounds familiar to you because this is very much a design-led approach. So businesses are moving from this management-led approach to, to change to a design-led approach to change, realizing that it's not just about completing a cycle of, of, um, of product development, but actually the business needs to get much better at inspiring the organization to invest, to implement, to sell and support services and experiences brilliantly. Now, behind uh, this move to design-led change, we've begun to see that there are seven competencies which are crucial for organizations to develop. Now, why I'm so excited about this, and I hope what will pique your interest, is as we go through these things this morning, you'll realize that these are design competencies. These are things that we do each and every day, and they are highly sought after by organizations. So there's an opportunity for us to begin to leverage these uh, in our projects and leverage them into the organizations and help them um, essentially get uh, more of the right things uh, to market faster. So what I want to do is whiz through these and explain to you what's behind them, why they're important, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the very first one is about vision. Now, that, that feels like an intuitive thing for all of us. We know that organizations are incredibly complex. They're full of very, very smart people who are very capable. They have lots of things to do. They're not short of ideas. But because of the way that organizations have tend to be set up around functional lines and silos that begin to develop, it's rare to find individuals or teams that actually can see uh, the full picture. And what tends to happen is everybody kind of sees a particular problem in their own light. It's like the old question, you know, ask a, if you ask someone in marketing, you know, how to solve a business problem, it's going to be like, more marketing, that's what you need. Or if, it's, if, you, if you ask the, uh, uh, the, the, the CTO, it's going to be like, oh, we need to invest in more technology. So they all tend to kind of pull the problem towards their own area of expertise and, and define solutions in those terms. And in that environment, what tends to happen is, is things become very unaligned and teams begin to compete. And the business becomes much more introspective and begins to have sort of an inside out approach to developing things. Let's make it and they will use it, as opposed to really understanding uh, what that's all about. And what they often lack is this strong central idea that everybody in the business can get behind, can understand, uh, can begin to own and realize how they can shape their bit of the business uh, towards that. So let me give you an example of this. Home for success. Who has heard of this amazing vision, home for success? No one. Good. I wouldn't expect you would. Um, who's heard of this business here, Unite Students? One? I think one person has. OK. Two. Good. So um, Unite Students are, or were, essentially a property developer and a landlord that provided student accommodation. And they've got, they have thousands of, 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 of rooms, hundreds of properties all over uh, the UK. Um, and, they, and they realized that they needed to develop some galvanizing thought that would help drive the business forward and, and help them make decisions. And they spent some time exploring their customers and what they needed. And they began to learn a bunch of stuff about students. And we've all been students, so we can all identify with this. Students are moving from home into the big wide world. They're this kind of weird, awkward thing where they think they're adults, but perhaps they're not quite adults yet. They've still been relying a bit too much on mum and dad. They've re they realize that they are both excited and incredibly nervous about going to university. They want to do well. They want to have a positive experience. They want to make friends. They want to be successful. They want qualifications. They want to get jobs. But they're really nervous about the whole thing. So this vision of a home for success was a response. And the business saying, you know what? For you, what we're going to focus on with a laser focus is about the social, emotional, financial, and academic success 
of our students and provide them with a home for success, to realize their dreams in university through where they're staying. And this has resulted in a whole range of products and services that are really there to hold the student's hand through this, this phase of their life and make sure that they can deal with those things that they develop um, life skills and coping strategies to really succeed. Now, this idea, Home for Success, has landed in that organization like free pizza. Everybody wants it, everybody gets it, they're working with it, they're understanding it. And what it's led to is a whole range of um, benefits, basically, that uh, you see in all our organizations that have a strong vision. It's led to much better planning of resources. It's led to transformational levels of investment can go out to their shareholders and say, you know, we need this amount of money to do that. It's inspired people within the organization to actually change. They've connected back into why am I doing this and why do I want to help people and how can I help people. It's created traction in the organization. It's given them, it's kind of throwing grit on the floor for them to move forward with. And it really has helped to uh, motivate people uh, to actually deliver. So the importance of a vision um, is absolutely critical. Second one, beautiful design. Now, um, here's the fact. Beautiful people get hired sooner, get promoted sooner, and get paid more than the rest of us. Okay, who's, who's found that true in their careers? Oh, yeah, loads of you. I thought so. Now, it's interesting that the same thing actually applies to projects. Um, they get kicked off sooner, they get ahead sooner, uh, and they also get more funding. But the question is, what is a beautiful project within an organization? Now, we understand in our lives what beautiful is all about. We know about the aesthetics of, you know, things that look beautiful, things that sound beautiful. We really understand what that's all about, about form, about emotion, and how that all connects with us. But how does something connect emotionally to an organization? Well, the thing is, organizations, they don't have sort of these, these higher brains that you or I have. They have pretty sort of cold reptilian brains. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to money. Something is beautiful when it costs less to create, costs less to market, costs less to deliver, and sells more. But this is how design helps to do these things. So something will cost less to create when, essentially, you get it right first time, and you're not messing around, and you get it out there quicker. So that's an idea that's been truly inspired by customers. It's one that's been co-created within the organization. Um, it's one that's been properly prototyped and understood, and faults have been identified and rectified uh, very early. And it's a project that's engaged that organization to deliver it. It's not run into the, the politics of not being invented here. Something costs less to market simply when it's marketing itself. So again, when it truly connects with the audience, when people are telling one another about this great thing that they have encountered, when it begins to go viral, when it leads to a positive emotional response in the customer, um, it reduces sales and marketing costs. Something that costs less to deliver has been designed with you know, a very sober eye on the real constraints that this product or service is going to face in the marketplace. It's understood about the constraints imposed upon it by the organization, by how things are going to be delivered, by technology, um, and by, simply put, you know, the, the complexity of the organization. And the final thing is around getting things to sell more. Now, how do you get something to sell more? Simply by broadening the appeal of what you're trying to do. Again, understanding customers, what they want, and how you can make this something for everybody. Now, at the end of the day, that, that's essentially good design, isn't it? Uh, it's all about getting it right first time, ensuring there's a positive response to what you've created in the market, making sure that it's elegant, that it's implicitly branded, and it has uh, broad appeal. And get those things right, and it appeals to this, this crock brain that exists uh, within the organization. OK, let's go on now to the next one. You can't get anything through 
any organization uh, unless all the key decision makers are on board with it and you've understood what all the, the key requirements need to be. That's just obvious. You know, there's going to be too many blockers in place unless you do that. But what we've begun to learn is that you shouldn't try to kind of get permission within an organization through a bunch of really sort of intense set piece sign-off sessions like you sort of have in a waterfall approach as we, as we know. What you need to do in terms of case making is to make it a far more collaborative approach, one that um, evolves through the course of the project, one that's far more cross-functional, far more design-led. Now, this all starts with establishing a value hypothesis at the beginning of the project. A value hypothesis focuses in on the benefits of what you're trying to do. So it's not just about the cold, hard cash at the end of the day. It's about the softer things, about how much this idea might appeal to partners, what it will mean from uh, an employee's point of view, so the employee experience. Um, will it improve the perception of the brand? Having understood that stuff, you can then begin to uh, use those benefits to apply that to inform the vision. So coming back to uh, the, the case of, of Unite, they were understanding that actually social integration, affordability, coping and lifestyle skills were critical benefits that they needed to, to focus on and that they could leverage. This case making then needs to be uh, continual as you go through the, the process. It needs to be cross-functional. It needs to be iterative. So as we are learning about things, we're beginning to refine it, we're beginning to develop it. But what you find is that actually by doing it this way, you begin to build consensus within the organization. You begin to build momentum to press forward with this thing. The barriers begin to, to, to be overcome. And you begin to remove the heat from these classic kind of set piece sign off situations. And you're able to position the total benefits of the idea. And the people who have to make the final call feel much more uh, supported um, in what they're doing. Now, here's an interesting fact. F it's true from Accenture. Have to believe that. 48% of R&D budgets are wasted. And they're wasted for two reasons. One is a poor understanding of customers. And the second is just being too slow. Too slow to get your thing out there um, into the market. And the longer it takes to get something out there, your idea just suffers erosion. I, mean, I don't know how many of you have, 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 have heard of this before or thought of this before, but, but I've often felt that a, a design process is largely, largely about compromise. You throw out a big and bold idea, you make it as kind of you know, punchy and exciting as you can, and then you're slowly just kind of compromising on that as you, as you get through to, to delivery. And at, at best, all that's going to happen is being slow is just going to dull the impact of your idea. Or at worst, it's going to lead to complete market failure. And we've certainly you know, seen enough of those um, in, in, in the past. But design-led approaches help. To, uh, to overcome this uh, in a number of ways. Um, it's making sure that the vision is formed. It's many, making sure that things are comp compellingly communicated and broadly supported. There are three areas that are critical about getting things kind of ready to go within an organization that the, uh, the designers can actually um, contribute to. The first is ensuring that the design packages that we put together are are well-crafted. So these are the things like, you know, the blueprints, the specifications, the architectures, the guidelines, the collaboration plans, um, the roadmaps, etc. making sure that they are align aligned and clearly understood. It's also about, as we all know as designers, making things as tangible as quickly as we possibly can. Now, from a service design point of view, that's obviously uh, the prototypes. That's making sure that you get the stakeholders out and actually give them an experience of the thing you're trying to create before you've actually created it. And it's simple things like, you know, the journey maps and the, uh, et cetera. Bringing that to life 
storyboarding, explaining um, is critical to, to the success. And then the third one, which I think is, is really interesting for designers, is actually about moving on to develop capabilities. So what we're, what we're really good at doing is, is shaping the form of the thing that we are creating. But what we need to do is get behind that and begin to shape the things within the organization that are necessary to deliver uh, that experience. It's design. It's just we're working with different materials. We're working with people, policies, processes, ways of working, behaviors, uh, that, that kind of stuff. Right, the fifth one, right conditions. So we know that great services and great experiences um, come, from, come from great organizations. And it takes lots and lots of people to, to get something through to make it a success. Now, John Cotter, who's perhaps you know, the leading light in, in the world of change, has identified what he refers to um, as this, this, this guiding coalition of people who are sufficiently invested and motivated in an idea to make things happen. So this is about choosing the team you're going to have working with you on that project, that they are the right people, they're connected, they're invested, uh, in the success of uh, the project to make that, that happen. They're the people who can kind of, you know, run the fence on the idea. They can inspire their colleagues to move it, to move it forward. So you've got to get that guiding coalition right uh, within, the, uh, within the organization. Also, you need to remember to innovate not only the proposition, so the thing that's going to go out into the market, but also to innovate the process. The way, the way you're going about creating that. Um, in the old world, the ways that organizations go about developing things is, as mentioned before, this, this very sort of, you know, straightforward product development cycle. They need to think differently about, um, about the way that they are um, they're, they're doing that. You need to innovate around how you scope the work. You need to you know, set up success around uh, understanding the, the dependencies on the project, negotiating the ownership and the governance of the approach you're, you're going through. And what you need to do is to uh, continually uh, reiterate this new way of working within organizations. Because what happens is inertia sets in. And the moment you sort of stop pushing forward, things revert back to so the way businesses are make decisions, uh, the way meetings are run, the way they operate, very quickly um, reasserts itself. So you've got to make sure that you keep pushing on with that and keep moving um, those things forward. Number six. Now, 3.5 happens to be a really interesting number. So we know that um, organizations that have highly engaged employees have on average three and a half times more earnings per share. That's good. We know that organizations whose employees are highly engaged, their employees are three and a half times more likely to solve problems. They also have only three and a half days off, which is good. And the great thing is, if you're engaged in your work, you seem to be three and a half times more likely to actually be uh, thriving in your life, which is very heartening. Um, what this tells us, actually, is that um, there is uh, a relationship between success and enjoyment and engagement in projects. If you have the right people, the right processes, the right purpose in place, it makes everything much easier. And with the boxes ticked, then the enjoyment and the engagement and the enjoyment uh, in the process comes from the originality of the tasks, new skills that the, the client team is developing, working on the project, and frankly, having fun. Now, this all comes down to basically a design process. You know, what, what we do when we design things, it's a very, very different process and way of working to what happens day to day within organizations. And it's really quite a magical, a spellbinding uh, process from our client's uh, perspective. 
um, the way things are co-created, the way that it's a, a very, very social process, um, is captivating for them. And when we get this right, uh, we see a number of things um, begin to happen. We find that engaging projects have much more what I refer to as gravity. So they begin to draw things towards the project. People, resources, uh, goodwill. Engaging projects provide a, a far more supportive environment for decision makers to take decisions because they're being helped towards those decisions by the conversations they're, they're hearing and, and, and the way people are contributing to make these things better. Engaging projects create much more buy-in within organizations um, as people want to get involved and share their thoughts and, and share opportunities and begin to um, uh, preempt and solve things. It improves the robustness of the ideas, obviously because um, we're preempting challenges that might, uh, might otherwise derail things, and we are preemptively establishing what those various workarounds are. But at the end of the day, an engaging project really unlocks and, and aligns things within the organization. Um, it brings in resources, it makes sure the ideas are really social proofed, and it begins to build confidence within uh, the organization. Okay, last one. So, we know that in uh, products and services that get developed, that, that quality is really, really important. But quality also counts in the way that we go about um, delivering a project and making sure that the, the tools and the processes and the outputs that we're creating in that project are, are really high quality. And I, 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 don't, I don't mean kind of, you know, overly done, but they're, they're well considered, they're detailed, and they're thoughtful. Because good quality outputs and tools in the project improves confidence within the organization, uh, it makes things far uh, more effective, and it, it increases the speed at which decisions can be taken and things can be delivered. And I guess from a designer's point of view, it's a really cheap trick, but we know that actually, um, you know, the more, the more detailed, the more rigorous some of those outputs are, um, it communicates to the client and to the people within the business who need to start to implement these things that quality is important uh, within this project. So I guess what we're saying here is actually the better the project outputs are, uh, the more attention the project will get, and the higher the confidence of the organization will be in what we're trying to achieve. And the more rigor, clarity, and detail that gets put into those tools and outputs translates into uh, the production and the delivery of the experience at the end of the day. So here we are. We have these seven competencies. And they should sound very familiar. They're the things that we are practicing um, each and every day. Because they are design competencies. They're at the heart of what we do. But they're competencies that organizations and clients are clamoring to develop and trying to understand and trying to make business as usual within, uh, within their organizations. They're realizing that what they need to do is move from this very sort of you know, management-led approach to completing a, a product development cycle into one which is much more inspiring, exciting, creative, where they are, you know, bouncing the, an idea through an organization, getting people behind it, getting them moving on, uh, and, and helping to not only to uh, invent, but also to deliver products, services, and experiences uh, deliberately. So I think the thing is, at the end of the day, the most important thing we need to do is help organizations get more of the right things to market faster, and a design-led approach to doing that is much better. So it's my view that actually, when we start thinking about what service design is and where it's going, is that it's heading in that direction. We're, we're moving upstream still from where we are. We're getting much more into the space that the consultancies operate in, and we're realizing that actually we have a fundamental skill set which is either complementary 
or an entire replacement for uh, traditional change management approaches. And really, serve design and the competences, competences that we have are becoming essentially an operating system for businesses to succeed. And that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs>